Let's talk about intrahential injuries. This is part 3 of a series called Head Trauma where we will discuss things pertaining to neuroradiology. From outside to inside, the traumatic intraaxial brain injuries are cerebral contusions and lacerations, diffuse axonal injury, diffuse vascular injury, and subcortical deep brain injury. Remember, cerebral contusions are the commonest intraaxial traumatic injuries, and lacerations are very rare and seen only with severe head trauma. Now, the cerebral contusions are also known as brain bruises or gyral crest injuries because they are seen at the ridges or crests of the gyri. They are secondary to a blunt force because of which there is sudden change in momentum of the brain which decelerates and there is a forceful strong impact against either the osseous ridges of the skull or the sharp edges of the fox or the tentorium. What we see in this diagram is a mm -hmm. coup injury where the intraaxial injury is in the site of the direct impact. After a while what happens the skull is stationary but the brain tissue inside moves in a direction opposite to the initial impact and it forms contra coup injuries within the brain parenchyma. These cerebral contusions are almost always multiple. They are seen in the grey matter and the adjacent subcortical white matter. 50% of the lesions are seen in the temporal lobe. In the temporal lobe, it is the tips, the lateral and inferior surfaces and the perisylvian gyri which is most affected. Second most common location is the frontal lobe and in the frontal lobe, it is the inferior or the orbital surface which is most commonly affected. A very important thing about cerebral contusions is that they progress over time. What happens is this perivascular microhemorrhages that are initially formed, they later on they coalesce and form a confluent hematoma. This picture taken from Frank Gaillard's Twitter shows the temporal progression of a cerebral contusion. Initially, we see these tiny petechial hemorrhages at the gyral crest near the calvaria. Later on, they coalesce and form a larger sized hematomas. Also, in the later stages, these petechial hemorrhages get surrounded by patchy, ill-defined, hypodense areas of edema. Let's talk about diffuse axonal injuries. They are the second most common uh, traumatic intraaxial injuries. They are seen secondary to high-velocity motor vehicle collisions. Sudden changes occur in the acceleration and deceleration. As a result, the grey matter moves at a speed different than the subcortical white matter and there is, as a result, there is stretching of the axons at the grey-white matter interface. The DAIs involve the subcortical and the deep brain white matter and spares the cortex very typically. Sites commonly involved are the corpus callosum, its genu and splenium, the fornix and the internal capsule. Here, initial NECT scans are often normal. Hence, we will suspect a DAI when there is a huge discrepancy between the clinical findings and the radiological findings. Initial CT scans may just show uh, diffuse uh, mild brain edema with sulcal effacements. MRI is superior than CT for detecting diffuse axonal injuries. The sequences of MRI that are useful here are T2, T2 flare, T2 star, GRE or gradient recall echo, SWI or susceptibility weighted imaging. The lesions appear hyper intense in T2 and T2 flare whereas they appear hypo intense in T2 star, GRE and SWI. We can talk about these sequences in a separate video. Majority of the DAIs are non-hemorrhagic and flare is the best sequence for detecting non-hemorrhagic DAI and SWI is best for hemorrhagic DAI. Diffuse axonal injury has been divided and graded by Adams and Generali into mild, moderate, severe. When only the frontotemporal grey-white interface is involved, it is mild. When the lobar white matter and the corpus callosum is involved, it is moderate. And when the brain stem, especially the dorsolateral midbrain and the upper pons is involved, it is a severe variant of diffuse axonal injury. Let's look at these cross sets from Radiopedia. The first one is a T2 flare. Here we can see multiple hyperintense foci in the bilateral frontotemporal regions. The second one is an SWI. In the same locations, we can now see hypointense lesions. Hypointense lesions are also seen in the uh, thalamus and the basal ganglia, all of which are part of the uh, temporal lobe only. And because in this case, the corpus callosum is not involved, brainstem is not involved, this is a mild or stage 1 diffuse axonal injury.
The next thing is a diffuse vascular injury. It is nothing but an extreme form of diffuse axonal injury where along with the stretching of the axons, there is disruption of the adjacent subcortical and deep perforating vessels. Only difference radiologically are these lesions are hemorrhagic and they are much more in number, severity and extent as compared to a DAI. Moving on to the next entity, the subcortical injury or the deep brain injury where the deeper brain structures are involved and includes the brain stem, the basal ganglia, the thalamus and even the ventricle. These may range from a mild traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage to something as big as a gross intraparenchymal hemorrhage. This is another scroll set which shows this large intraparenchymal hemorrhage in the left basal ganglia region with extension into the left lateral ventricle also. also the the blood forms a cast in the lateral ventricle here. Another thing that we should touch upon here is the presence of air in the intracranial compartment or pneumocephalus. When this pneumocephalus produces a mass effect and neurological deterioration, it is a tension pneumocephalus. The picture here shows the most common location of a pneumocephalus, a subdural pneumocephalus which is crescentic, which is confluent and usually bilateral. They also move with change in position of the patient. Here we see that the uh, frontal lobes appear pointed which is the famous Mount Fuji sign. Also the frontal lobes get compressed downwards which is obviously indicating a tension pneumocephalus. The next image shows the second most common location of pneumocephalus, subarachnoid pneumocephalus. Here the air is collected in the form of dots and droplets in the cisterns and sulci. This very importantly should be differentiated from fat because a ruptured dermoid cyst can also show findings similar to a subarachnoid pneumocephalus. So that's all for this session. Meet you in my next video. Stay tuned.